I'm Shachar Azani, and welcome to this JBS special from Israel itself. I'm right here in central Israel, as Israel is experiencing its 10th day of operation against Hamas, the terrorist organization in Gaza. Much has happened since, and I've been able to meet with many Israelis in the course of a few days of being here. And I can tell you that there is nothing greater than the spirit of true resiliency with the people of Israel as we come together in this battle against Hamas in Gaza. A few days ago, violence erupted also in the West Bank. In the course of the violence, two IDF soldiers were injured. They were evacuated to a nearby hospital and the news continued to report about the escalation that is taking place between Israel and Gaza. However, take a moment to think about those two IDF soldiers who were wounded. These few seconds on the news are a lifetime for many IDF warriors who are and were wounded in the course of battle. Today, we visit in Kfar Truman in central Israel, where it's housing Brothers for Life, a special group of IDF warriors wounded who have come together to help other wounded IDF warriors. It'll be very interesting to get their take on what this experience means for them as Israeli citizens, and especially bearing in mind their individual backgrounds. Today, we will speak with a few of them and get a glimpse into what is truly taking place in their hearts and on their minds in this difficult time. Thrilled to be here in Kfar Tuman in central Israel at, with the Brothers for Life. Two of those brothers are with me at the moment, Ohad and Sneer. Such a pleasure for us, for me, to be here with you. Pleasure to have you here. And uh, through you, through us sitting here, to have your voices echo throughout the United States of America and the world through our show at JBS. Um, so let's begin. I'd love to ask you first, how, how are you feeling? in this trying time for Israel. The past 10 days have been quite challenging for many Israelis. Maybe you can share that a little bit with our viewers. It's a, it's a very stressful time in Israel. I can tell you uh, personally, I live in the center of Israel. And um, about a week ago, I was walking my two Labradors outside when, when the sirens went off. My wife was at home um, by herself with our three children. And my heart just dropped and I, I ran as fast as I could with the dogs in, into the house. The, door, the, the back door was locked and I was knocking on the door like crazy and I saw her running down the stairs with our uh, three-year-old twins to the bomb shelter and, and my heart was racing. Um, we made it into the bomb shelter just in time. Um, and then at three in the morning, the sirens went off again and we ran into our kid's room and I saw my three-year-old son running down the stairs, hugging his doll, crying. And that's, uh, that's a picture that's still you know, stuck in my mind and probably will be for, for a long time. Um, no, no person should go through this, especially not children. And, and again, I live in the center of Israel. God knows what the families that live in the south especially near Gaza. We need to say have been going through this for two decades. Yeah. Very trying situation. What about you, Sneer? Well, I think this situation right now is throwing me back to the times in the army. Most of the time I'm trying to think what I should do right now, if, you know, just waiting to wear my uniform again. In the, in the other time, I'm just trying to explain my kid that we're having a camping and building tents in the shelter in the safe room. Watching them uh, going to the shelter without knowing why, are they, why they're going there or whatever, just trying to explain them in the best way, in the best positive way what we're doing. It's, it's something that I cannot even imagine in words. And I hope that this period of time will, will end and we'll see peaceful days because this is not what children are supposed to expose. You know, I, I want to touch upon this because Ohad just mentioned it. It's one thing to go through these experiences yourselves and it's completely another 
to think about your, your wives, your spouses, your children. You know, that image you had that you just mentioned about you running, rushing back home, thinking that your wife and kids are there while the alarm is, you know, sounding. And that's a horrifying backdrop. Just to think about your kids in this situation. How, how are you coping with it? Like, how does it make you feel? The fact that you have these children in your care and you are under these trying circumstances. I think the main thing is, is just to explain the kids and that we're trying to build, build our connection through this. We don't care if this, this is a bad thing or a good thing. The only thing I want right now is that my kids would never remember the horrifying moments of war. I don't want them to be aware about what's going on. So right now I'm trying to give them a whole different image of, our, of what's going on right now. And I think, you know, for me, watching my kids running to the shelter, it's a picture that I'm not even want that anyone in this globe will, will feel. I, um, I'm looking at you and, you know, we are here at the Brothers for Life house. And I have to ask you, Israelis are going through a very tough time. But there is another layer here, because you're not just Israelis. You're IDF warriors, and this house is dedicated to the IDF warriors who were wounded during their army service. And you were injured as well. And you're part of this, this experience, which adds another dimension to it. So only if you're willing, maybe Ohad uh, and Sneer, if you can share a little bit about your personal story, your experience in the idea, so that we can learn a bit more about you. Sure. Um, I was injured in 2005 um, in an ambush. We were patrolling an area south of Hebron, uh, me and another three soldiers in a, in a light uh, vehicle, and we were ambushed by three terrorists. And while still sitting in, in the vehicle, I was hit by uh, two bullets um, from an AK-47 in my stomach. Um, later on, I, I understood that one came out of my chest and the other one is, is still inside uh, until this day. But at that moment, I, I didn't realize it was bullets. I thought maybe it's shrapnels or something like that because the adrenaline hits you like, like nothing that I, that I can describe. And, and so, the moment that we understood that we were being shot at, we jumped out of the vehicle and we started to shoot. It was, it was pitch black. The only thing that we could see was the muzzle flashes from their rifles. So we started shooting back everything that we had on us towards those flashes. And when they stopped shooting, I lifted my head and I noticed that um, our driver was, was shell-shocked. He was on the ground uh, screaming and our commander um, was on the ground unconscious, uh, laying in a pool of blood. And me, me and my teammate, we, we dragged our commander back so the Jeep would provide him with some cover. We noticed that we, he took a hit in, in, in his shoulder, in his main artery, and he was losing a lot of blood. When they started shooting again, we took the ammunition from his vest and we continued on fighting until they stopped again. That's when we tried to call for help on the radio, but everything was destroyed from, from the shooting. So we, we tried to call for help with our cell phones. Eventually we reached our battalion in, in the, back in the barracks. And we knew that they're coming uh, to rescue us. We just didn't know how much time it would take them to get to us. In the meantime, Yuri, our commander, was bleeding to death. He was not responding. And my stomach was, was burning. That's when we noticed uh, a civilian car coming from the Arab village that was right next to us. There was a, a single male uh, driver. And what we did, we, he, we just pulled him out from, from his vehicle, and all four soldiers, we got into his vehicle. We took the driver with us, and we started to drive away uh, in order to get to the hospital as soon as possible, because again, Yuri was losing a lot of blood. We didn't know how much time he has left. And after a couple of minutes, which felt like forever, uh, we noticed the entire battalion driving towards us. And my whole upper body was sticking out the window, waving towards them. So they would, 
you know, they would recognize me and not open fire towards us. And when, when I saw that they noticed me and they stopped, we took Yuri out of the vehicle and me and him uh, were rushed in an ambulance to the nearest hospital, which was in, in Be'er Sheva. It's only when I got to the hospital, I heard the doctors standing above me while I'm laying um, in my uniform that are soaked with, with my blood, with Yuri's blood. They told me that they see two bullet holes, but only one exit hole. And they're gonna send me to do an x-ray and from there to the emergency, uh, to the operating room. When I, when I woke up, my hands were, were still covered with, with Yuri's blood. My, my family and my friends were there. They told me that um, Yuri is alive, um, severely injured in his right arm, but he's alive. Um, there were three terrorists. Again, um, one was killed from the shooting exchange. The other two um, fled. They tried to escape, but um, a unit of, the, of our paratroopers were able to close in on them and capture them. Uh, I spent in the hospital four days, just four days, um, but I can tell you those four days were uh, some of the, the hardest days of my life. The, the transition from being a combat soldier, feeling pretty much invincible, that you have the back of your teammates and your commanders, and then less than 24 hours later, you're in a hospital bed, I can't even go to the bathroom or take a shower without the help of my mom and dad. You know, I, I, I just became an infant again <laughs> in, in just one night. You know, that was something that I also mentioned in my introduction, and I want to spend a moment about this. For many people who watch the news, especially coming from Israel, the idea of a soldier being wounded in the course of battle usually occupies a few seconds of a newscast. They'll hear that two soldiers were injured, one was this, one was that, and that's it. The whole story goes away for millions of viewers who just observe it on a momentary basis. But listening to you, you realize that you're talking a true moment of transition in life where something happens that doesn't, doesn't just transpire on those first four days, but actually lasts for life. This is a significant change in who you are. And you only grow to understand it when, when you're in a hollow place like Brothers for Life, which really, when the, that realization of that sacrifice sinks in. Sneer, maybe if you'd like to share with us a little bit of, of your story, what, what made you, um, what brought you here? First of all, I think telling my story here in the Betachim, in the Brothers for Life house, it feels like home, even when it's in English and, and with the public. I can tell you there are many, many people out there at home who feel for you. I can speak up for them, just like in the course of the year I will speak up for Israel when I'm out there. And I want to take that moment to convey that those feelings of great warmth and admiration and tremendous respect that so many people have for you and for your sacrifice and for what you do for Israel. So just know that this does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. And I want to make sure that you hear it on the air today as we speak. Sorry for interrupting you. Thank you. So I served in combat engineering forces. Uh, I joined the army in 2006. Um, I had a wonderful training and a wonderful service. I served for five years as an officer. I, during my, ser during my, my service, I also uh, took a very important part in Operation Cast Lead in 2009. I think in this operation, I swear that I'm not going back to this land. After we finished the operation, I actually uh, did another position in the Army and retired. Um, like many of others, I went to my big trip. I traveled the world. Where did you go? Uh, uh, Far East, India, whatever. Um, like, you know, like every Jewish person in the world who has Jewish mother, I started to study. Uh, I studied in the IDC. After uh, one year in school, uh, Operation Protective Edge was started. My battalion commander called me and said that we need to build a new force. Yeah. Uh, we had to deal with the terror tunnels. In the Israeli army, everybody needs to do service um, duty until you are 42. And if you are an officer, sometimes it's much more. 
So I joined the army again uh, in order to find and locate and destroy destroyed all the terror tunnels between Gaza and Israel. So here you are, promised to yourself in 2009, 2009 that you're not, you're not going to go back to Gaza. In 2014, you were there again. Yeah, just like that. But, you know, I think this is the, um, something as an Israeli that it's inside of you. Knowing that you can make the switch in your mind in two seconds, I don't think there's any other army or place in the world that can do that. So when I joined the army again, I built my new force. Um, I called all of my soldiers. I took only my best soldiers. I called 20 of them. And together with the new commander, I was the company lieutenant commander, and my company commander, Ophir, which is also part of the brothers right now, we started to work in Gaza. We used to work in teams of three, two, of, two uh, soldiers and one officer at the time. We used to go in Gaza, find a tunnel, and go back every, every night. Unfortunately, um, July 21st, we got an information about a tunnel that lead under the dining room of Kibbutz Beri. Kibbutz Beri is uh, one mile from the, the border of Gaza. We just drop everything we did. We concentrate in this tunnel um, since we got the information that our, the Hamas is going to attack in the same night. We started to drill. We started to look for the tunnel. Usually it took us like 20 minutes. Back then, we couldn't find a tunnel. Apparently, now I know to say that the tunnel was 200 feet down Earth. Our tools were uh, around 180, something like that. Right when the sunset was in our eyes from the west side, Hamas troops launched an anti-tank missile, a uh, very developed one. Um, very, very good one, directly into my force. I remember sitting, uh, falling on the ground, uh, feeling a huge sharp in my hand. I couldn't hear anything, like it, just a deep buzz sound. And um, when I looked back, I saw my soldiers lying on the ground, different injuries, um, but I decided that, you know, what they are teaching you in, in the Marine Academy uh, or in the Officers Academy is that if they launch an anti-tank missile, they are coming to kidnap. So I took my grenade from my left pocket and put it in my center pocket. I said, they are not taking me with them. And um, after two seconds, I realized that I can shoot. I took two of my officers from the belt and we started to shoot back. When I understood that the, the nobody is coming, I um, looked back and I started to evacuate all my soldiers. We put them on the stretchers, we put them by hands, most of them were burned or uh, severely injured. We, um, we evacuated to the, to the choppers and um, then I evacuated myself. I, I want to stop you there for a minute. First of all, again, true heroes, both of you, all of you. Um, many of the, I, I want to ask you about your professional experience in the IDF. We live in a time where many in the social media and international media are talking about, you know, the IDF being inhumane and targeting innocents. And can you share a little bit uh, through, through your eyes about that aspect of being part of the IDF and being warriors as you are. What does that mean, the, what they call the ethical code of the IDF, the humanity of the IDF? How does that manifest itself on the ground? Yeah, actually, we were just talking about this the other day, and Sneer shared with me um, an amazing story that he never told me before, and I'd rather that, that he told his story uh, instead that I uh, take any uh, screen yeah. time the cleaning of the house. So um, there was a time in the army when we used to explode all of the terrorists' houses. Only after the court decided that we can, uh, we can explode it. Sometimes 
the terrorist lives in a building house. Uh, you cannot explode the whole floor, you cannot explode the whole building, of course. But what the IDF is doing in order to explode only this area, sometimes it's only the room of the terrorists, is that we are evacuated all of the stuff. We are cleaning the place with brooms in order not to ruin the, the, um, the humanity of the person. We are not even the furniture, even the, t the TVs, we are, to, we are taking this out. The only part we are taking care of is the building itself. It's only the walls. And I can tell you even one more story. When I w used to go into the tunnels, you can see concrete bags with a sign, in, with, with letters in Hebrew. It means that they took this concrete that dedicated to building hospitals, to building, to building schools. That they got as humanitarian supplies, sometimes post-operations, and you would find these exact bags of concrete with the Hebrew letters inside those tunnels? Exactly. And nobody can tell me different. Nobody can tell me it never happened. I saw that in my own eyes. And here we are, sitting together at this magnificent house, Brothers for Life. You are Brothers for Life with others. Can you share with us a little bit about what does that mean, Ohad? What does it mean to be a Brother for Life? How did you end up here? What is this place? That's a great question. You mentioned before that uh, people around the world see a small headline um, that there is an injured soldier in Gaza or in Lebanon and then after 30, 60 seconds it goes away. But then Brothers for Life steps in. And we know about every injured soldier that, that gets injured in a matter of, of hours because we're connected to the IDF and we're connected to the Ministry of Defense. And so when an injured soldier um, gets to the hospital, we know um, who he is, um, where he's from, and most importantly, um, what is his injury? And we have visiting teams all over Israel and say, um, we get a notice that a soldier lost his leg because his vehicle um, drove over an IED, an, an, uh, an explosive, and, and now he's in a, in a hospital after losing a leg. So we'll contact um, our visiting teams and we'll send over two injured brothers that have prosthetic legs to go visit him in the hospital. And that's very important because when you're laying there in the hospital, and I, and I remember that very well, you think that your life is over. Right? I looked at myself in the mirror, I saw my flesh burnt, scarred, the, the bullet holes, and I thought, my life is over. I'm going to be single for the rest of my life. And I'm never going to go to the beach again, and I'm never going to go to the swimming pool again. And then when two, when two guys walk in, and now the lucky ones have their family and friends with them, you know, but there are a lot of lone soldiers in Israel that came from North America or any other place in the world that has a strong and supportive Jewish community. The lucky ones have friends and family with them, but, but even still, my, my family, my friends, they didn't know what to say. They, you know, my parents have had dreams for me, and in the moment I was injured, all those dreams, they, they, they went out the window, because they, they don't know if their son is gonna make it. As much as I have um, supportive family and, and supportive friends, they, they can't understand what, what, what the flashbacks are, what, what the, the nightmares mean, the panic attacks, the anxiety, the depression. They can't understand it. And, and so when those two strangers walk in and they lift up their, their sleeves and they show you their prosthetic legs and said, we were, we were just where you are a couple years back and now we're here as part of Brothers for Life and we're married and we have kids and we have a diploma and we have a career and you're gonna have all of that. And you can't see that from where you are right now, but we can see it for you. And, it, and there's a, a very long and dark tunnel ahead of you, rehabilitation, and getting your life, reclaiming your life, but we're gonna walk that tunnel with you, hand in hand. 1,000 injured brothers here in this organiza organization are gonna walk 
through that tunnel with you and we see the light at the end of that tunnel. Maybe you can't see it from where you're, when you're, from, where you're from right now, from where you are right now. But, but we're going to hold on to that hope for you until you realize on your own that there is a light at the until end of that tunnel. On your own. Sneer, how welcome are those efforts? Like if you were there in that situation, do you, I mean, what the reactions, what kind of reactions are you getting from, from those injured IDF warriors? Are they, do they understand where you're coming from? Or, or are they in the mindset of leave me alone now? How does that work? That must be a tremendous psychological process. I think the answer that you're going to hear from, from most of the brothers here would be, in the beginning, I didn't want to come. I don't want to come to a place that, because you're, when you hear organization and non-profit organization, you're hearing in your mind, it's actually a translation, okay, these are a bunch of whiners whining about their injury. I don't want to be part of that. Because in the beginning, like Kohat said, you're sitting in a hospital, you was an IDF officer, you was a bomb expert, whatever, you coming from a hero to zero in, in one second. And I think one of the most important things in, in this is that you don't understand how much none of the 1100 people in here are desperate or whining about something. By the way, the only thing we are asking from our brothers is not money, is not coming here every day. We are just asking choose life choose life because it's so easy to go into your injury and stay there you know what i think the best example would be my father is um severely injured in in the first lebanon war in 1982 and he was a medic in a special forces he got a very difficult time with his ptsd i remember myself when people ask me, I even tell them, used to tell them that I grew up without, without a father. But in the moment in the hospital that the doctor gave me his phone and told me, call your parents, my mother was crying. But my father grabbed the phone and told me how many casualties. I said three because we, I thought we lost all of them. He told me, can you hear me? I said, no. How do you know? He said, it doesn't matter right now. Get your ass back to Gaza. So after six hours at the hospital, my father telling me to go back to my unit and to be the new commander of the unit. I didn't understand what he wanted to say in the beginning, but what I'm trying to say is he was the only one who understand me because of his injury. And if my father had brothers for life, 20, 30 years ago, probably the situation was much, much better. But he was the only one who understand. And up until today, there are only 1,101 people that I can speak with them about my injury. My brothers and my father. And only because they have the same experience. And you know what? I just want to say that coming here was the best decision that I ever did in my life. When, when I first heard about Brothers for Life, like Sneer said, I didn't want to hear about Brothers for Life. The words disabled, injured, um, you need to understand. And, and you know this because you were born here. This society is a very macho society. And if you're a combat soldier, that multiplies by 100. You think that you can take on the world on your own. And it's very hard to admit to yourself that you're in a position that you can't do it on your own and you need someone to to reach his hand and, and help you up and at 2013 um, I found myself after going to school and, and, and getting a job and getting married um, my, my wife was was diagnosed with cervical cancer and, and after a year of chemo and, and radiation therapy uh, she passed away and you know, in, in Jewish tradition, we sit together for seven days, we mourn together, but after those seven days, everyone went back to their lives, their responsibilities, and I didn't 
didn't have much of a life to go to because during her treatments we stopped school and we stopped working and we stopped everything so to sorry, focus so on, on her uh, condition. And at that point in time I said, I can't do this on my own. I picked up the phone and I, and I came to the brother's house to meet with, with the person who was in charge of taking in the, the, new, uh, the new members of Brothers for Life. And when we sat together, he took both of his legs off and he put them on the table in front of me, his prosthetic legs. He put them on the table right in front of me. And, and that's when, when I, un I understood for the first time that this is a place that I can just take off that Superman cape, hang it on the entrance of the house, and just be myself with the flashbacks, with the nightmares. Until this day, I have a nightlight um, next to my bed because I'm terrified from the dark. And, and it took me a long, long time to say that out loud because it's embarrassing. You know, my three-year-old has a nightlight next to his bed. A 36-year-old man is not supposed to have a nightlight next to his bed. But I'm not embarrassed to say that anymore. Because in this house, with, with these brothers, I can, I can talk about anything. And nobody's going to feel sorry for me. And nobody's going to judge me. Nobody's going to tilt their heads, you know, with, with mercy. Because what I've been through, because there are over a thousand different stories here. Some of them worse than mine. Some of them uh, less worse than mine. But it doesn't matter. Here in Brothers for Life, it doesn't matter where you served, how you got injured, um, who you voted for, the, the color of your skin, your religion. We have Bedouins here, we have Druze here, we have Christians here, we have Jews here, Russians, Ethiopians, religious, secular, none of that matters. The fact that we, we served in combat and we were, we were injured in combat, that's it. That's all that matters. And when I, when I first started here, the, the PTSD program helped me to cope with my grief and, and to start dating again, to feel that I can actually love again. The, the, medical, treatment, the medical program um, helped me with some of the, the complications that my injury um, to my stomach did. And then um, I got a scholarship to go back to school and finish my degree. Yeah, when people come in here, it's like they're a safe house. You can see here doctors, software engineers, they are coming here between their shifts, between their work, between the kids, and they are coming here. They can be themselves, exactly like Oha just mentioned. And this is the, mo the most pure place in the world. And I think also in our decisions as an organization. I don't think there is any sister organization to what we are doing because from the CEO until the last of the employees, everybody are wounded soldiers. We know exactly what the best for our soldiers. If a soldier is having a, an issue with himself, PTSD terms, medical treatment terms, or even financial terms, we're going to take care of it because we know how. And we can move to the right place. We can flow exactly where the soldiers need, needs us. And sometimes, you know, we don't have any bureaucracy. I don't see any organization in the world who don't have any bureaucracy. We are a private organization. We are not getting any penny from the government. We are fundraising our own budget, annual budget, only from private donations. So just support? Just support. And the support comes from Israel or from the world or both? The support coming from both, most of the support coming from the US, uh, Canada, a little bit from Europe and Israel. And I can tell you that we are not, we don't have any donors. We have partners. Because some of our partners can help us in so many ways. Some of, that, of them will help us to fund and some of them will help us with their connections and some of them will help us as a hosting family to our soldiers. Just, you know, to give our soldiers a, a moment of silence in this craziness once in a, in a year. So that's what I'm trying to say. I think our partners are helping us to survive 
they are our bridge to the diaspora. They are our bridge to Israel. We are the beautiful Israel. Nobody can say us. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I, um, you're mentioning international partnerships and support coming from the U.S. Oh, hi, I'm noticing behind you there is a purple heart. And I'm just wondering, what, what does it mean? Who gave you? I mean, what is this? What is it doing here? We have uh, about 15 different delegations every year to 15 different Jewish communities around the world. Most of them are in North America and in each delegation, 10 of us uh, injured brothers, we stay with five different hosting families. Uh, I can tell you that my hosting family from Long Island back in 2014 is, is, is family. It, it's family. I, I love them more than I love my extended family, um, to be honest. Uh, I, I speak with them every week. Um, the strength that they gave me, um, spending the time with them um, seven years ago. It, it's still, you know, they came to Israel, they stayed at my house, they came to Shabbat at my parents' house. You know, this is not partnership, this is family. And, and on those delegations, um, there are three things that we have to accomplish in every delegation. One of them is, um, meeting with Holocaust survivors in the community. The second is talking in schools, Jewish schools. Um, and the third is meeting with injured soldiers in the community. It could be American injured soldiers, could be Canadian injured soldiers. And I can tell you that it doesn't really matter where they're from. The connection of sitting to soldiers that were injured in combat. It doesn't matter if you're Israeli or Canadian or American. The common ground, it, there's, there's nothing like it. And when we meet with the American veterans and we start sharing our stories, their, their jaw drops because they never spoke about their injury. You know, they, they come from a war that could, could be thousands of miles away from home. They come back to a community that doesn't know what army life is like. But in Israel, everyone served. My parents, his parents, our, our siblings, uh, probably our children, everybody served in the army. So the conversation is much easier in Israel than, than it is anywhere else, else in the world. I mean, we were injured an hour away from our home, two hours away from our home. Some of us were injured 10 and 15 minutes away from our home. There's, there's nothing in comparison anywhere in the world. And when we meet with those American veterans, we start talking about our, our injuries, it's like, for them, it's like we're performing, performing this magic trick. Like, how are you talking about this so, so freely? And it's not a magic trick. It's sharing your story over and over and over again until you finally reach a point where you can say, I'm okay with this. I'm, I'm whole. This is, this is who I am. This is what I've been through. Sure, I have flashbacks. Sure, I have nightmares. This is my life, and I'm going to do the best with, with what I've got. I'm, I'm, we're choosing life. It's, it's not for nothing that we chose those two words on the entrance to our house. And like Sneer said, coming to this house, you don't need to pay admission. You don't need to do any chores. You don't need to volunteer. None of that. The only thing that you need to do is to take these two words and engrave them in the back of your mind. That even in, in the worst days, that you have no energy to get out of bed and you hate everything and everyone, that you have these two words engraved in the back of your mind. And if you don't have the energy to go to work, don't go to work. If you don't have the energy to go to school, don't go to school. Pick your ass up and come to the house and be here with other people who are going through the same things that you are going through. And this American soldier, I'm getting back to it, this American soldier called Chris Brown, he was so shocked and, and um, inspired by, by our, um, our sit-down that a week afterwards, this came in the mail for us. And he actually sent us his Purple Heart. The Israeli soldiers that get injured um, don't get a, a medal, but the Americans do. And it's called the Purple Heart. And Chris sent us his Purple Heart, and in the bottom he said, same blood, same bullets, same tears. And it's exactly that. Same blood, same bullets, same tears. Wow. Truly, I sit with you in awe. Sneer, 
Uh, just to conclude this part, how do people follow you, get in touch, learn more about what you do? Because the issue of PTSD is unfortunately ubiquitous in many parts of the world, including the U.S., and I think your um, abilities and experience and, of course, this grass, grassroots initiative could be of tremendous help for people out there and also for others who wish to express sympathy and support. How do they get in touch with you? So the best way to get in touch with us is our site, or we still have an office in Seattle. Uh, it's called Brothers for Life. Um, it's not very hard to get into us, but um, I think I just want to ask from people to know where exists to spread the rumor about Brothers for Life, to spread the rumor and to help us, to support us. We're going to decide exactly how we're going to support our soldiers. But like I said before, nobody can understand, like us, how to help our soldiers. I just want to ask from you to be partners, to come visit us. Every Jew in the world is welcome in this house. But up, up until you are here, only when you are here, you are understand what is this organization is. And like I said before, we are not getting any penny from the government in order to be private and to do our own thing. So I am asking to help us, to support us in any way you can. And I, uh, I just want to tell you that I can so echo your words because it just, it grabbed me, you know, meeting you just by chance. And you think about that moment when you hear about so-and-so got injured, but you never give it another thought because it kind of goes away. You either hear about something else on the news or, you know, God forbid, casualties of a greater degree, and you never stop to think about this. So I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you for the hope and the inspiration that you spread around. Thank you because you are protecting not just the state of Israel, but the Jewish people. And I am honored and privileged to have you on JBS and to share your story with the millions of Americans and out there and the tremendous audiences that can take so much from this conversation. So to Darba, thank you so much. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. So to understand a little bit about what we actually have here, what is this house of the Brothers for Life? I'm so happy to have with us Oz. Oz. Such a pleasure. Nice How to are meet you? you? I'm great, thank you. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your connection to this place. You are a brother. That's right. I am a brother. I served in the IDF uh, between 2012 until 2014. So you were also part of the Protective Edge operation. I've been in the Protective Edge operation in 2014 in the Gaza Strip and um, I served as a, as a sniper inside the, the Golani Brigade in Special Forces. I had a team of uh, 12 uh, combat soldiers and um, during the operation uh, our mission was to locate terror tunnels leading to Israel and uh, with the other Special Forces teams we had to uh, communicate with them, show them where the tunnel is and uh, with them to actually destroy these tunnels. Um, we've been uh, protective edge operation last for almost a month. And uh, while I was uh, actually, it was the last before one day before the last day of the operation, I was with my team next to the last tunnel we found. And we've been waiting to the other forces to come and actually destroy this tunnel. And while we was waiting over there, um, we were standing on a little mountain, not a little mountain, but a small one. I was actually next to two of my friends, to the team. And suddenly, boom, I just felt something horrible hit my back. I didn't know what, what it was at first. I found myself on the ground, tried to raise up, and I didn't, one, the first time in my life that I couldn't, pick myself up from the ground. I sent a, an order to my legs and to my arms to lift me up from the ground and it just didn't happen. So I took a look on, at my arm and I, basically I didn't see there. What happened, my arm folded behind my back. 
after I was got injured by two bullets, one hit my elbow, exit from the elbow and entered to my right lung, into the chest. And another bullet at the same time hit my back. Thank God I wore, uh, I had the bulletproof vest on me that uh, actually saved my life. And then you, you ended up with the brothers after your so, injury? After the injury, I evacuated to Soroka Hospital. And uh, as the brothers do, a brother came to me a few days after my injury and introduced him to myself. He had uh, an uh, elbow injury as mine. He introduced the organization to me. At first, I didn't know what he speaks about. And after a month, when I was in rehabilitation, I joined the, the organization and started to be part of the family. Amazing. So when we're talking about the house, what are we seeing here? So in this in incredible house, we have, first of all, the entrance, which in the entrance, it's written, Ubacharta Bachaim, right, chose life. Right, that's where I came from, right. Right here, you can see the pool. Mm -hmm. The pool, we also swim, but also we have hydrotherapy treatments over here, besides the physiotherapy treatments over here. In Brothers for Life, we had many activities. Part of them are with sport, because sport is, helps a, a lot of our brothers. Right. Here we can see um, we have a gym, a wonderful gym that we basically come here and, and uh, do exercises. We have many kinds of sports like cycling, swimming, um, paddling, uh, tennis, running. So I was uh, at BFL as a member. I got a scholarship into, in order to go into school. Now I'm basically uh, finished my school and now I'm helping other brothers as a worker here in BFL to build budgets for their households in order to, um, to act better with money and in order to, to be better with financial issues in life. Right. Um, it means uh, debt recycling and uh, refinancing. So you, you're basically providing that service, that educational service to the brothers. Educational, financial education, that's and, right. And you, you mentioned scholarships, BFL provides scholarships for BFL warriors? BFL provides scholarship in order to go to, uh, to the university, in order to gain a profession and start life um, back, yeah. This house is basically um, a place for our brothers to come and relax and be proud in this thing that called Brothers for Life because this place, everyone feels equal. Everyone can dis detach from their injury and their PTSD luggage and um, just enter here as a human being. Wow, that's amazing. And you know, I, I couldn't um, help noticing this incredible wall. Maybe tell us a little bit about the wall. What are we seeing here? This is our picture, a wall of pictures actually. Right. Involving pictures from many delegations and uh, journeys f abroad we had. We had uh, journeys to the Kalimanjaro, to Alaska, uh, to Iceland. We had um, many brothers here um, in uh, quiet days. We have two injured soldiers um, joining our family in quiet days, which has no... Two, uh, two soldiers every... Two injured soldiers every week, every, every week, week wow. joining BFL. And in this time, since uh, the last operation started, we had like 14 brothers um, in hospitals, which we also already reached to them and um, uh, understand their needs, their family needs, and trying to help them um, as much as we can. Brothers for Life, truly an inspirational concept that we've been able to breathe some content into it. I just want to ask you, uh, in conclusion, what's your message, Oz, to our viewers? What do you want to tell them? You have the opportunity now to send this message out there. What do you want to say? I just want to say to you right now that, as I said before, two injured soldiers in quiet times are joining BFL. We had right now in the, in the, in the organization 1,100 guys, 1,100 brothers that actually are um, taking part of our activities the members come in here in order to grow, in order to reclaim back their lives, actually, that um, taken, taken from them by physical injuries and emotional injuries, PTSD, and, um, and heart symptoms, actually. In order to support, in order to support Israel and the Jewish nation, you don't have to wear a uniform or hold um, an M16 in your hand. There are many ways to support Israel and the Jewish nation 
and Brothers for Life does that. We know how to take care of our brothers. We know to find their needs and to get to our brothers while they're injured, God forbid. But actually, this is the reality in Israel. And um, we need the help of our partners in order to do that mission. Thank you so much, Oz. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our viewers. Your words truly echo, not just in my ears, but in the ears of so many around the world. It's been an absolute pleasure for us to be here and experience that deep and profound camaraderie that exists between IDF warriors. And to be part of this, to be part of the greatest Jewish family of not just Israel and the IDF, but Jews all over the world. I'm Shachar Azani for JBS in Israel. I wish to thank all of you for joining us and wish to see you again soon as we continue to cover Israel under attack and send the real story behind the facts, quick sentences and images we sometimes notice on the media. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay happy and stay healthy. Shalom and Lehitraot from Israel.